Okay, why don't we start? Hopefully, Miriam will join us soon. I'm going to call the June 18th meeting of the city petition to order. Could we have a roll call, please? Commissioner Conway? Nielsen? Here. Bellman? Here. Dawson? Here. Greenberg? Maxwell? Chair Schifrin? Here. Yeah, I know that uh, Commissioners Conway and Maxwell are not going to be here, for, uh, are absent with notification. Um, are there any statements of disqualification? Are there any oral communications? Are there any announcements? I assume there's nobody uh, from the public on the line. Is that correct? That is correct. We will now move to um, presentations. Resilient um, O Santa Cruz update. Welcome, Tiffany. Uh, nice to see you. And the campus is a staff report. Or we're just turning it over to you. Can't hear you. Thank you for that. Hello, commissioners. I will share my screen with you right now and. Uh, we will get started. Okay, I think you can see this. You can see my screen, yes? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Okay, very good. Uh, again, nice to see you this evening, Commissioners. I'm Tiffany Wiseless, the Sustainability and Climate Action Manager for the City of Santa Cruz, and I'm here to give you a quarterly update on the Resilient Coast Santa Cruz initiative. I was last in front of your body regarding this topic in December of 2019, and we have made some progress since then. So just to remind you very quickly that um, we are looking to develop a future, a vision for a resilient future coastline, addressing things like access, tourism and recreation, transportation, the need to maintain ecosystems, habitat and connectivity, um, we have existing coastal infrastructure and policy that needs to be evaluated. We've projected that over a billion dollars in infrastructure and property alone is exposed and vulnerable by the end of the century, driving one of the drivers of this project. And then, of course, we have our special sense of place and cult cultural identity here in Santa Cruz. And as I've emphasized in uh, my times before you, we also are really trying to center equity in this project, um, trying to create this inclusive conversation uh, for a community vision. And again, this is a, a we're looking at both near-term, medium-term, and longer-term solutions. The time horizon on this, these projects is the end of the century. Obviously, more details in the near term. And again, looking for a really resilient and equitable coastline. This project, once again, or these, this initiative consists of two projects, the West Cliff Drive Adaptation and Management Plan funded by Caltrans. That's being led by Dr. David Revel from Integral. He is on the line also uh, today. And then our beaches project, which will result in a local coastal program update to integrate sea level rise policies and strategies to support beach and public access protection uh, is funded by the Coastal Commission and is being led by Ross Clark of Central Coast Wetlands Group. He's also on the line here. Um, just to remind you, we have a 17-person technical advisory committee, including Chair Schifrin and others from the community and from other commissions. We have a multi-departmental uh, city team working on this, and we've been working closely with State Park, uh, California Coastal Commission, the Boardwalk, in addition to many other groups that have been involved uh, so far. Just to remind you of the geographic scope of this initiative, we really are looking at everything from Seabright Beach on over to Natural Bridges. So that includes the cliffs, bluffs, beaches, and the development backing them. So really, there's just a very small um, portion of the city that is the city's coastline that is not included in the scope of these projects, but hopefully. Um, we will have a future project, potentially in collaboration with UC Santa Cruz. So to date, uh, just to recap, uh, when I was uh, in front of you in December, 
We were just finishing up the existing conditions and future vulnerability assessment for West Cliff Drive and some initial work on the beaches project. Since then, uh, our consultants have completed adaptation strategies and pathway evaluations um, for the different stretches of the coastline. We've broken this up into um, the four beaches uh, where we are lumping uh, the pocket beaches of West Cliff together and then four zones on West Cliff. So we've evaluated these adaptation strategies and these pathways, which again are, are the short to longer term um, strategies uh, across these different sites um, within the scope of the, the geographic scope of the project. Um, we also um, have uh, delivered, has been delivered a socially vulnerable population impact assessment, which I encourage you to take a look at. All of these deliverables are available at the city's website, uh, cityofsantacruz.com forward slash resilient coast. There's a document box on the left hand side. I do want to point out that this um, socially vulnerable populations impact assessment is is quite unique and um, we're pretty proud of, of the direction this is going um, in addition to the rest of the technical work on the project that you know a lot of folks are, are watching and then I think as many of you know we've been utilizing virtual reality um, to uh, supplement the engagement on uh, this initiative. So just to share with you some snippets from each of those deliverables, but again, you can dive in more and more detail um, in the documents. Uh, this re represents our West Cliff Drive, uh, Zone 2 Elmar Avenue, uh, and West Cliff Drive to Lighthouse Field State Beach. And what we're showing here are um, areas of high hazard, areas of high risk, areas of high hazard are uh, sea caves, undercuts, areas of um, extreme erosion. We're also showing uh, the intersection of those two things, high risk and high hazard, as well as um, projecting out, if we did nothing at all, what the uh, cliff erosion extent might look like in 2100. And um, we're showing coastal armory that has both 10 years of life left and that that has longer life left. So we have similar um, depictions for all the stretches on West Cliff and the beaches. Um, little different format. Our consultants have also prepared these tables to really guide us in looking at short to long-term adaptations of both the bluffs, the beaches, the cliffs, and the transportation network. Um, this uh, was developed through uh, public input and uh, department head and TAC input in terms of selecting um, or identifying uh, preferences for shorter and longer term uh, adaptations. Um, we have not done any type of recommendations or anything like that at this point. And I will point out that the transportation um, adaptations are called out as in our, uh, our grant uh, with Caltrans that we do need to look at these different scenarios uh, of transportation adaptation. And then, of course, we need to look at the technical feasibility, the secondary impacts, and so forth as we continue to try to educate our residents and our decision makers um, and as we turn in um, very soon into narrowing in on the recommended strategies. Um, just to remind you all that we are utilizing this adaptation pathways approach um, due to the uncertainty of when we might experience these climate influence impacts on these coastal, coastal hazards, i.e. sea level rise, you know, the extent when it's coming. We're using this adaptation pathways approach, which instead of saying, okay, in year 2040, we're going to build a seawall or whatever the, the, the project is, instead there's a physical trigger that signals to us, okay, it's time to initiate or transition to that next phase um, in the adaptation pathway. And that really helps us to um, prevent early investments, premature investments, or investments too late, and really tie those two physical triggers uh, in most cases. And here's some examples of those triggers. And then also, here is an example of what an adaptation pathway visualization can look like. In this case, Seabright Beach, I want to emphasize here that this is just an example, and um, you will find uh, refined uh, versions of these pathways for um, all the stretches, uh, again, are posted uh, at our website. 
So if you start in the upper left-hand corner here, you see that um, the existing strategy is listed as revetment, and in this case, it's primarily riprap, um, uh, I'd say patchy riprap. Um, there also has been dune restoration on the beach, and sand is being retained by the Harbor's West Jetty. Jetty. If you recall, I believe I might have said previously that um, the sand, the Seabright Beach is uh, two-thirds greater in width than it was before that uh, harbor jetty was uh, installed. And so you look on the far right-hand side and you see the trigger. The trigger here is uh, loss of protected certainty of dunes and cliff impacts by storm waves. Now those will be quantitative um, at some point. So what does that exactly mean? Um, once the threshold when that, that metric is defined um, is passed, we would then transition into the next stage or uh, next phase of the strategy, which would be a living shoreline. So in this case, it could potentially be a cobble dune with some more native planting, potentially enhancing and expanding the existing dune that is there. Again, we're looking at the same kind of triggers, uh, but cliff erosion is another. Um, and when those thresholds are passed, we would look at some kind of retreat option, potentially one-way traffic uh, with parking, um, in a recreation trail, and then at some point continuing to potentially closing uh, vehicle access. So this kind of walks you through what the adaptation pathways really looks like. I've shown this slide before, it's been enhanced a bit, we've done extensive, extensive outreach. I do wanna point out that um, we will be turning, um, if you look at the bottom row here, we will be turning towards our next public engagement in July where we will be getting feedback on these different adaptation strategies uh, for the different stretches from the public and our uh, different stakeholder groups. We will be supplementing that with the phase two virtual reality, which is going to come out in a mobile phone app, and it has a couple visualizations of what some of these um, adaptations might look like. And then we'll also be checking back with our underrepresented groups. And we have one more touch point with the community uh, in the late fall that's scheduled as we turn into um, adopting these final deliverables. Um, in terms of equity, uh, you know, we have been spending time with our frontline community leaders, uh, particularly the beach flats, designing meetings with them, conducting um, meetings down in the beach flat garden and park. Um, we've really been leveraging academic partnerships. Uh, UCSC's Coastal Science and Policy Graduate Program has really brought uh, capacity, as well as San Jose State University, who uh, worked with us on the interviews in the Beach Flats. They have really brought capacity that we did not have to focus long-term on these frontline communities. And we're learning so much, um, some of which is really germane to this initiative, but other things that I think could inform other projects and other initiatives that the city is interested in and the community is interested in in the beach flats. Um, we've had one-on-one -on -one meetings with uh, 13 different historically underrepresented groups, um, LGBT folks, youth, elderly folks, uh, people living with disabilities, um, people of color, and so forth. And with respect to health and all policies, which was the last time I was in front of you, I believe in January, we are doing things internal to the city that are really elevating equity that I think has the potential to improve our outcomes, um, not just on this project, but um, more broadly. And one of the things that has come out of the work so far is this, this graph, where we, or this table rather, where we took the feedback that we heard from historically underrepresented groups from the frontline communities and, and worked it into uh, an assessment of overall level of service and access limitations, and, and that's been color-coded here, and that's really looking at things like, okay, is there access available? What about ADA access? What about gender-neutral bathrooms? And so forth. Um, so that's, uh, you can find more about that in our, um, our documents at the website. So now our next set of deliverables, which we actually have just received um, for the Beaches Project, up to three sets of adaptation pathways, and um, we'll be getting a cost-benefit analysis here in the next couple weeks for the different stretches um, of West Cliff Drive and adaptation pathways for all of the beaches. We also received some conceptual designs for some of the transportation adaptations. 
And as I mentioned, the virtual reality is going to be coming out in the next month or so. And so um, we will be uh, going to the community with some of this work, as I mentioned, in July. I'm not going to review all of this here, but I did want to share with you how the community outreach, how the TAC input and various data sources kind of fed into this project and where we are. And you can see we're really t turning into the home stretch here. Um, you can see uh, at the bottom of the page that we're, we're working towards the adaptation pathway recommendations. Um, we'll have this bit of input and then we will be developing the West Cliff Drive Adaptation and Management Plan that will take the form of a public works plan. Um, we're working on right now what the CEQA uh, analysis will look like for that public works plan and the LCP amendment with the sea level rise policies, uh, specific both towards the beaches, but also pulling out policies from the West Cliff Drive project that will be integrated into that LCP amendment. And that is scheduled um, to, these documents are scheduled to be finished and adopted by city council by the end of the year, around the end of the year, perhaps January, and then go to the Coastal Commission for approval uh, soon thereafter. Um, and with that, uh, I just want to thank you. And if you have any questions, and I've provided the link again for uh, the website where all the deliverables can be viewed at. So I'm happy to take any questions that you might have or any comments. Thank you very much, Tiffany. Uh, do other commission, do commissioners have any questions? Cindy? Oh. Sure. Um, thank you so much for that presentation. I just had a couple of quick questions. So the first one's regarding um, you gave us an example of Seabright Beach and, and the triggers um, the, the, the physical triggers that would change, take you from one pathway to the other. Um, you also had an arrow in there and a dotted line that's had the transition zone. And so um, when I was looking this and reviewing this, um, I, I know the intention isn't to be reactionary. Obviously you have that transition period bit uh, built in there. I was wondering if you could talk to me about, since you're waiting for a physical event to happen, what's the trigger for that transition from one pathway to the other and and kind of how, how do you guys envision that working yeah the i like i said just to see these pathways um, from our consultants i haven't had a chance to look at the revised version this example that i gave you actually was extracted from the draft version that had been developed a bit ago and as I said, the metrics will be assigned to that in terms of what the number value looks like. But it, the, the threshold that's selected gives us enough lead time for the planning also, for the planning and the implementation. So that's something that we, you know, I'm expecting to see uh, a little bit of discussion in, in these deliverables that we just received. Okay. Um. Let me see if I can ask it a, uh, a little bit of a different way. I, I, I perhaps didn't actually get out what I was trying to ask. Um, so uh, I think in the example that you gave, it was something like uh, storm damage to back dunes or something like that was the trigger from one pathway to the other. So that's a, 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 a discrete event. But you also had this arrow that was saying, well, you know, we know this might be coming, so we may need to be um, improving the integrity of the dunes by cobbling in more native plants. So I'm trying to understand how we know when we're transitioning from one to the other. There we go. So that we're, so for, from where the black dot is to the red square, um, what it, what triggers the black dot there? Because th that's not the actual event, the loss of protection of the dunes, right? That's something else. So what is the black dot there? I'm just trying to understand that part of this. I do think it's a progressive loss of protective certainty of the dunes and then the cliff erosion itself, which would be, you know, a rate. Um, as I okay. said, I haven't seen the next version of this. If, uh, you mm -hmm. know, Ross is on the line, if he would like to chime in and, and provide a little further explanation if he's able. Um, I, I would welcome that just to 
try to get you a little more clarity on that, Commissioner. Yeah, thank Ross? you, Tiffany. Um, sure. So you can hear me, right? Yes. Yeah, go ahead, Brian. Hi. Um, we, we've tried to um, identify um, numeric uh, triggers in the document okay. we've submitted this week um, that are not, uh, don't describe catastrophic events, but describe mm -hmm. um, uh, initial um, identification of impacts that gives us time to respond, either by shoring okay. up existing infrastructure or doing the planning, permitting, and design needed to transition from one um, pathway or one strategy to the next. So we're not looking for the, the failure to suggest um, um, a, a new action, which in some ways is what we call um, business as usual, and which mm -hmm. we have been doing for a long time as repairing or upgrading as things fail. And we want to get past that and be um, proactive. Great, thank you, that was super helpful. Um, and then the other question I had for you, Tiffany, was um, you said that you spoke with um, underrepresented groups and one of the categories was fishers. I was just curious, is that uh, commercial fishermen or recreational fishermen or both, or um, what did that engagement look like? And that's it, thanks. Yeah, sure, um, we spoke with a representative of, um, the, it's not commercial fishermen. We really were having a difficult time reaching commercial fishermen, but um, a representative and I'm the name the name of the group is escaping me right now. But um, they represent about 600 fishermen in Santa Cruz area, and um, it, they are doing both river fishing and creek fishing as well as coastal fishing, and so it really only involved that one engagement for the fishers people. So um, we are continuing to try to make connections to folks um, in the commercial fishing industry, but just have not been successful, so. Great, and I thank can you. Get you that, yeah, I can get you that group name if you'd like to. It's just not at my fingertips at this moment. Sure, that would be great, thank you. Okay, I'll follow up on that, thank you. Do other commissioners have questions? Well, my uh, lead one to believe since I'm on this task force that I have all my questions answered already. But I think being on this task force has just led me to have more questions. So I'm gonna take some time and ask some questions. I don't have too many. I did look over the documents that were on the website and on the Westcliff Adaptation Management Plan, the tables 10.8, 10.9, which are really seem to be the the, from my perspective, the important tables um, in that project because they they list the different projects. They have information about their upfront costs, their maintenance costs, their effectiveness, certainty, secondary impacts, and lifespan. And I think that information is all potentially helpful, but it wasn't clear to me the way the uh, the uh, cost information was presented was three dollar signs, two dollar signs, one dollar sign, and it isn't clear what those represent. Um, you know, certainly orders of magnitude they rep are you know are clear, but is one dollar sign ten thousand? Is three dollar signs a million? It's just not particularly since cost is going to be a major factor in in terms of knowing what's going to be done, it seems important to have a sense of what the different, um, you know, what the different costs are. So sure. Is, so do you have an answer to that? I, I think I might have asked that question before. And yes, you did. You did. So um, if you recall last time, we had the same answer, um, is that this was our first attempt to uh, uh, try to uh, ascertain cost relative to other strategies, right? And as we had mentioned last time, this next deliverable contains the cost benefit analysis, which will utilize some more specific cost estimates for the project. So you will be seeing that very soon, Chair Schifrin. So the chart, the next uh, go around with the charts will define what those dollar signs are talking about. 
I have not seen exactly what that looks like yet, but I'm anticipating um, there will be something like that. Yes, and, and Dave Rebel can uh, keep um, preparing. Upfront and maintenance. Mr. Ravelli, you had your hand up. Go ahead. You have to turn on, on your muted. It doesn't show that Dave is muted with a red handle and a line through it, so it has to be something else. Um, I don't know if Tess or someone else that's on the call from planning can help us with that. Yeah, yeah let me see. How's that? Okay. That's okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. I've been on computer audio and now I'm on phone audio. So. Yeah, phone um, audio. Uh, Chair Schifrin, you you have asked that question before, and I attempted uh, in to, to sort of be clear in these tables in particular. Uh, as, as Dr. West said, it, it really is a uh, relative estimate in these upfront maintenance costs in the, in the tables 10, 8 to 10, 11 or 12 that you refer to. Um, right now we have just, as of yesterday evening, gotten the cost estimates from the coastal engineers for all of these different strategies that you see here. Um, really, we started with a whole host of what was potential under adapt and feasible under the adaptation strategies. We narrowed this down from all the extensive public out outreach that was led by Tiffany and, and, and others. And, um, you know, so we arrived at, for Westcliff at least, all of these different sort of preferred short-term and long-term alternatives. We used sort of a relative ranking of costs and estimates. And then as part of this cost benefit analysis, which includes far more than just how much, what's the upfront cost and the upfront, you know, and potential maintenance costs, but many other things like ecological services, recreational value, um, we're starting to get into the, really the weeds of those estimates. Um, so I just got the construction cost estimates and the maintenance cost estimates yesterday from our coastal engineer. So um, some of these are, uh, and so I would say that it ranges up to, you know, the three stars is, the three dollars is probably in the millions, the two stars is in the hundred thousands, and then the one is probably in the tens of thousands, if I had to provide a relative ranking today. But um, some of these costs surprised me a little bit. Um, they were doing some other things. Uh, you know, I'm not an engineer, um, but the engineers really weighed in on getting some dollars and cents to it. So you'll, you'll see a lot more in the cost benefit analysis documentation coming forward. But um, this really was to help the community and the TAC and the department heads and the city understand what some of the trade-offs and what the relative cost may be to help us focus the more detailed analysis on adaptation strategies, both, both for the coast and for the transportation court. I think that, I mean, I, I certainly think that's good. I, I, as you know, the process has been uh, difficult with the pandemic. And so it's hard for me anyway to stay on top of what I've you know, what I know and what I can expect. So it wasn't totally clear whether this was what we'd already seen or this was something new. But I hear what you're saying. I'm hoping that there'll also be some definition of the effectiveness certainty in terms of what is high, medium, and low mean. Um, because again, I think it's important for decision makers and the public to really have a sense of, you know, this is going to last 100 years, this is going to last 10 years, this is going to last whatever. So, I mean, I, I know this is all um, projections and estimates and not the final, but I think to the extent it can be as quantitative as possible, it's really helpful. I then had a, trying to understand, there's, there's so much to this, uh, and, I, and this isn't meant critically, it's actually, um, it's very impressive how much information these reports have how comprehensive they are in terms of the various issues and concerns, but it's a little overwhelming of understanding where do we go from here? You know, there's going to be a, a plan, I guess, in your last slide, 
a proposed local coastal pro uh, program amendment and a plan, and then there's going to be an expectation that the city is going to be moving forward to implement this plan. And there's just so much in it. You know, the, the coast is so complicated. There's so many different zones and then spots within the zones. I mean, I think, and I, I, maybe I asked this question or I don't remember, but I'm hoping that as plan, there'll be uh, a list of priority projects. What are the projects that we have next? I have to start looking for the money, money for, because there are certain parts of West that need remediation now, and hopefully the plan will be pointing in that direction as it gives an overall strategy for the longer term. Yeah, absolutely, Chair Schifrin. There will certainly be a prioritized set of projects, and in fact, it's very likely that the public works plan will be approved for those priority projects that are in short and medium term because we recognize that this plan for West Cliff Tribe is probably going to be revised, you know, every 10, 20 years and things could change. And so that's also going to help us with that, uh, the permitting that needs to be closed out on the existing revetment. Um, and then in terms of funding, that is also part of the scope of these projects is to, um, identify to the extent possible funding streams that we can take for these um, projects. And I'm already working on grant proposals to get some of that funding, um, in particular for the monitoring program that will need to be put in place um, in order to monitor those triggers and thresholds. My last uh, question to seek process. Um, as you mentioned, the plan has to go through CEQA, the Public Works Plan has to go through CEQA. And I've been recently, a oh, welcome, Commissioner Green, nice to, that you're able to make it. I see you've joined the meeting, great. Um, I see that uh, um, I've recently been reviewing the uh, draft EIR for the Walk Nest. And it's an interesting uh, environmental document because it's both a programmatic EIR and a project EIR, to use the sort of CEQA terminology. So much plan is being looked at at a more pro level. These are the kinds of things that we're going to have to do over time. And then there are two projects, the East Terminal and the, the Gate, that are projects. And they are being looked at in So from what you're saying, it seems to me, and tell me if you've gotten this far, if I'm understanding it correctly, that the plan itself will be analyzed in the CEQA document as a, at the programmatic level. But the individual high priority will be analyzed at the project level so that if the, uh, the, the works plan is approved in, with that kind of a CEQA document, probably uh, will be an EIR, then there will, not, there will not be the need for any further environmental review for those priority projects. So am I understanding kind of how that process is going to work? Um, not necessarily so. And I'm going to pass it over. CEQA is not my area of expertise, although we have been having a lot of discussion about what this is going to look like. And I'm going to ask Catherine Donovan, um, who's on the line, to share where we're at in the CEQA in terms of what's necessary for CEQA. Hi, Chair Schifrin and other commissioners. Um, we are actually consulting with the Coastal Commission staff and our uh, CEQA consultant on exactly how to, there, there are a variety of directions we could take on this. Um, and we've, we haven't come to a final determination, but we have been discussing it with them. and. What you have described is is one of the possibilities. The outcome that we would like to to achieve is to have a document that would include uh, the CEQA approval for the relatively near term projects. So, as Tiffany said, probably within the next ten, possibly twenty years, so that we could just move forward with those projects. Um, but it all depends on exactly what level of detail we get um, because some of these will will have more detail on exactly what we're going to do 
than with others. Um, so the so the exact uh, process, CEQA process hasn't been determined yet, but we're we're working with um, the Coastal Commission and with our environmental consultant to determine. But you have, you know, what you described is something that we have definitely been considering. Well, I think the point you make is a really good one because um, the ability to do a, you know, a, a project level analysis means you got to know what your project really is. So to the extent that some of these short term or priority projects are well defined, then I think it's possible as part of the CEQA document to really do a detailed analysis of them. Um, I think in the end, since I, my sense from just reading the document, that many of these are not that well defined yet. Um, it may not be possible to do that many of them with, within some realistic budget at this time um, because there might be a great deal of design work that would have to be done before you could really understand what the environmental impacts might be. So I think it is going to come down to how far along is the city in identifying the specifics of the project, because that's what needs to, I mean, it's in the programmatic, you can talk about it in general and with the understanding that this is what you know now, these are the impacts you can look at now, but it, as you go forward, it's going to, before you can build the project, you're going to have to really look at the, um, you know, have a lot more information about the potential impact. So um, it's going to, it's because there's so much in this, um, it's going to be, a, and, I, and I get this from what Donovan is saying, it's going to be a complex job to really define a good project description. For the um, for the plan, and it may well be that much of it um, will have to be done at the programmatic level in order to um, not be and, and not be it will not be possible to really not have to do stuff additional kinds of work. So it's it's a real challenge because the situation is so complex. So I'm, I feel. Uh, um, things are moving from my perspective in the right direction. So. And we will be back in uh, the early fall, late summer, I think September-ish. Um, and so we will we will know by then, um, and we will report back to you as well. well. Before the commission and the council can make a final decision on the plan, there will have to be a secret document. So. Mm -hmm. That's another consideration to the extent that it you want to move forward and get the plan approved. Um, it may be necessary to be dealing with things at a more programmatic level. Um, yeah. Otherwise, you could end up taking the next couple of years designing some of these projects. Okay, um, Commissioner Greenberg, I don't know if I don't, I wasn't, I'm not sure when you were. Uh, we're able to join us, and I wanted to give you a chance to ask any questions you might have. Uh, you're muted right now, so if you want to say anything, you have to take the mute off. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. I don't have any questions right now. Okay. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. Thank you, and I'm sorry that I was I was late, having some technical difficulties getting getting on. But nice to be with you, and thanks for the presentation. Of course. All right, well, very good. Thank you very much then, commissioners, if there is nothing else. And thank you to our consultants for being uh, on this call also. Um, they've been doing some, some very good work for us. So thank you. Okay, thank you. Appreciate it. Okay, um, we now will move forward with item number two, the approval of the minutes of April 16th. These were continued the last meeting based on some Questions about um, how um, about them? Are there any further questions about the minutes of April from April 16th? And if not, would someone uh, like to make a motion to approve the minutes? I'll make a motion to approve the minutes of April 16th. Is there a second? Second. Is there any 
discussion? All those in favor say aye. Oh, no, we better aye. do a roll. Sorry. Uh, let's have a roll call vote. Commissioner, can you hear me? <laughs> sorry. Yep, yes. I'm unmuted. Okay, sorry. Um, Commissioner Conway Nielsen? Aye. Stallman? I need to abstain from this one. Dawson? Commissioner Dawson? I think we lost her. I don't see her on the Where roster. Um, let's see. No, there she is. Let me unmute her. Commissioner Dawson, can you hear us? Yeah, can you hear me? I can. We're, yep. Yes. Uh, yes, I vote aye. And I, I dropped off the video, but I'm still on the phone. So, uh, I'm here, but you can't see me. <laughs> okay. I'm, I'm working on getting back on. Um, Greenberg. Hi. Maxwell. Chair Shippen. Hi. And I want to thank Steph for their work on a little problematic procedurally, and I appreciate the staff following through on it. So let's move to the minutes of June 4th. Are there any comments on, on those? Not. Would somebody like to move approval of the minutes of June 4th? I'll move approval of the minutes from June 4th. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? Let's have a roll call vote, please. Commissioner Conway. Nielsen. Aye. Spellman. Aye. Dawson. Aye. Greenberg. Aye. Maxwell. Schifrin. Aye. Okay, we'll now move to item number four, public hearings. No one have a staff report, please. Hi, uh, good evening, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Yes. Yes. Okay, hi. Samantha Hasher with the Planning Department. Um, so, I just wanted to preface this item with um, this was intended to be on the consent agenda. Um, these types of slope variances usually come before you on the consent agenda. Um, this is an improvement in the rear yard. Um, we received no public comments. And um, so in our opinion, it's pretty straightforward. Um, we do have a presentation prepared if you want to hear it. But um, like I said, it seems like it's pretty straightforward. Is there anybody and uh, who's called in from the public? Um, hold on a second. There is a member of the public, but they haven't raised their hand. Okay. Um, is there a mem uh, Is there anybody on the commission who would like to hear a, uh, a more detailed staff presentation? Would the member of the public? Uh, or whoever is here from the public like to hear a more detailed staff presentation. Hearing nothing and seeing none, um, I'm going to close the public hearing and bring it back before the commission uh, for discussion and action. Do any commissioners have any uh, discussion on this item? I just have a yes, uh, Commissioner Spellman. Yeah, I just had one one question. It's really having to do with the pool equipment, right? So the equipment is being proposed on the let's call it the north north or the west side of the house, which seems to be the side that's closest to the neighbor next door. I don't know that this is an issue, and there is a condition. Uh, in the uh, conditions of approval that it will somehow be mitigated to temper the, the sound of, of that equipment. I'm just wondering, one, has that been, what, what do we do typically in those scenarios, right? How do we protect the neighbor that, you know, may not be aware of a project going in and that it's there kind of thing? Is that a sufficient uh, condition of approval in your opinion? Hi, this is 
Lane Zorich, associate planner with the city. I'm the planner working on the project. Um, so we do have um, regulations in our code regarding pool equipment that the pool equipment has to be uh, covered and behind uh, the fence line so that it's not open to the public and that it has to have some sort of cover around it so to minimize the sound. So that will be reviewed upon the building permit and it will be checked off before the uh, final approval is written off for the building permit stage. Okay, so there's no real check of, you know, how much sound is actually being generated or control of that. It's more of an aesthetic, let's fence it off and put a lid on it kind of scenario. The, the pool equipment is pretty far back from the side property line. Um, it is, um, they are very large lots and it is probably looks to be a closer distance to the side property than it actually is. Um, I don't think outside of our, our normal review process for pools that this would cause any additional noise other than what normal noise would be associated with properties. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> yes, Commissioner Nielsen. I just have a follow-up question to the, about the pool equipment. What is the, uh, what's the side guard setback um, within the zone and does that, um, does the equipment shed uh, project into that setback? Um, I believe it's seven feet for the side yard setback for the R17 zone district. Um, I would need to double check whether or not it um, goes into the side yard setback, although I do think it is allowed to be in that area because it is just equipment and it's not a structure. Okay. Any other questions from commissioners? Chair Shipley, somebody else? I yeah. just see that the, um, the member of the public has their hand raised. I don't know if you want to address them or not. Um, given the complexity of Zoom, I will hear from the I will reopen the public hearing and hear from the member of the public. Please state your name and you um, provide us your testimony. Thank you for being here. Oh, hello. My name is um, Megan Bishop. I'm the landscape architect on the on the project. Good evening. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Go ahead. Yeah. Oh, okay. Great. Yeah. I just I I had just wanted to um, answer the question about the pool equipment and um, on projects like this before before um, the pool equipment uh, is always um, the product is always uh, given to the planner the planning department and the building department. Um, and it's rated a uh, decibel rating. Uh, there's a usually a minimum, uh, or excuse me, a maximum decibel rating on the pool equipment, and it always has to fall below that. So um, just to ensure that the sound is is kept uh, pretty quiet. Just wanted to add that. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you. Close the hearing again. And any further commission commissioner questions? Somebody like to make a motion on this um, item to approve the staff recommendation? I move to approve the staff recommendation. I'll, I'll second. second. <laughs> um, okay. Um, Commissioner Spellman made the motion to approve. I think I heard Commissioner Dawson before I heard Commissioner Nielsen, so I'll say Commissioner Dawson. Seconded the motion. Is there any discussion on the motion? We have a roll call vote, please. Commissioner Conway. Nielsen. Aye. Spellman. Aye. Dawson. Aye. Greenberg. Aye. Maxwell. Chair Schifrin. Aye. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, let's move on to information items. Are there any information items tonight? Um, this is a question for staff, I think, Samantha? Uh, normally. Sorry, I was trying to get my mute. <laughs> um, no, I have no informational items. <laughs> oh, 
Okay, um, thank you very much. I, uh, oh, sorry. Greenberg. Am I, is this where I should do an update on the housing subcommittee? Well, uh, the next item is subcommittee advisory body oral reports, and that's, that's what the I thought. Okay. <laughs> Give her your report. Go ahead. All right. <laughs> um, so just quickly, um, we met uh, earlier this week, and it was uh, Ju Julie and I and the staff from the Economic Development Agency, and um, including Jessica Mellor. Uh, and uh, uh, Lee was not able to be there, Lee Butler. Um, and we, uh, one of the things we talked about was the mandate for the planning, for the housing subcommittee, and the fact that we had, we started our work uh, in, I'm gonna give the, uh, the dates here. We started our work uh, really in around, um, December and then got, you know, working in January and then um, beginning in March, once COVID hit, we're not really able to work. And so we uh, feel the need to extend the work of the housing subcommittee. And I'm wondering what the procedure would be uh, because we lost a couple of months of our six month mandate do we need to take a vote on that? Is that something that we can, um, you know, that we can that we can just sort of undertake? Is there any kind of procedural issue As here? I understand it, and Steph can correct me, um, the six-month mandate is related to the Brown Act, and that under the Brown Act, if you have a committee that extends for more than six months, um, it's considered a public committee, and it has to meet all the notice requirements. It can no longer meet in private. So mm -hmm. what this has done is that committees end, and then they have to be reestablished, reestablish a similar committee for another six months. But that would have to be, as I understand it, on the subcommittee itself can't do that. That would have to be done by the, uh, by the full commission. So if that's a recommendation from your subcommittee, I think every staff can check with the city attorney to see if my understanding is correct. And maybe we can have this as a regular agenda item on our next meeting so that we can discuss it. Um, Samantha, okay. did you add anything here? Um, yeah, I, w I would have to research that section to see if that's accurate, but um, yeah, we can we can check with the city attorney on that if you like. Okay, because one of the things we talked about is that we had on our agenda really to address the inclusionary ordinance, the new inclusionary ordinance of 20% um, affordability and how that uh, interacted with, for instance, Section 8 um, and other, other kinds of affordable housing development that um, we're trying to expand in the city. And so we fine-tuned the, uh, the section, the, excuse me, the inclusionary ordinance um, in terms of different kind of thresholds within it. And we wanted to then get more feedback on the new fine-tuning. Um, so that's one, one thing. Another thing is that we wanted to move on to talking about workforce housing um, as a major agenda item. And we really have only just begun discussing that, and that was really what we were going to begin doing uh, when when COVID hit. Uh, and that also may involve some interface, for instance, with the school district. Um, we're interested in looking, for instance, at a case study project that the school the school board is interested in um, for workforce housing, and also studying other approaches to workforce housing in other cities. Um, and related to that is a question of the idea of diversity of housing types and how that might be kind of built in also to the workforce housing effort um, and questions of how that's possible within our, um, our land use and zoning codes. So um, we are, you know, really rearing to go but do need some more time. 
And so it would be great if that were possible. And I guess at the next meeting, we can find out um, how that how that might work out in terms of, you know, our authority to continue our work. And our okay. Work. So that kind of relates to the next item, which is items referred to future agendas, because I think um, it's important to get a report on the status of the subcommittee. If the subcommittee by that time has any rec specific recommendations, mm -hmm. um, if, if those could be brought forward at the same time, there may be a separate agenda item uh, in terms of the commission taking action on them. Because I think the commission is going to have to take action on the status of the subcommittee. If the subcommittee has any recommendations, the commission can take action on those or not yeah. on those recommendations. So, um, you know, I think it, it isn't appropriate tonight to get into that, uh, into right. the substance, because it's really not on the agenda. But I think you've, you know, you've stated the problem. I think um, unless staff comes up with a different understanding of how it, the system works, um, it should be on the next agenda for uh, consideration. Make and sense? I think, and the next meeting is going to be in August, is that right, or do we have one in July? Um, yeah, the, the next meeting is July 16th. Okay, July 16th. All right, good. So, so that we deal of time sorry? to work. I'm sorry? It gives you a good deal of time for the subcommittee to yes, work. Yes, no, we definitely, we are going to have recommendations, I believe, at least on the inclusionary ordinance by July um, for, for people to review. Great. Any other, well, you've got the subcommittee report as part of our presentation tonight. I haven't, the task force for the Resilient Santa Cruz really hasn't met for quite a while. Um, I don't have really anything in addition to report. Does anybody else? I, I don't think we have any other committees. Or subcommittees. All right. Any other items for future agendas? Oh, seeing, hearing nothing, um, we're adjourned. Thank you all very much. Okay. And Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye, Bye everyone. <laughs>